Hello there, and welcome back to the channel. Mad Mike here, and uh, today uh, we're going to do another uh, video in the uh, director series. And today we're going to be looking at Robert Zemeckis. And uh, Zemeckis is—he's one of my more favorite directors. He's a really, really fun director. Most of the movies that he directs are, you know, especially in his earlier years, very, very fun films to watch. Um. And of course, you know, even his dra even his dramas, uh, his later works with Tom Hanks uh, and stuff like that are really, really good. But uh, let, you know, let, let's just dive into it, and we're going to start off kind of with his uh, his background. So he went to Uf uh, USC for uh, film school, and then uh, not long after that, uh, he came to the attention of Steven Spielberg. And it's kind of a funny story because uh, Spielberg uh, describes it as uh, he basically walked immediately past his secretary. Uh, into his office and began showing him a student film that he had made at uh, USC, and uh, Spielberg immediately uh, grew to grew to like his directing style, and he helped produce his first two films, uh, which I'm going to glaze over a little bit because they weren't really big films. They're not bad movies, uh, to be fair, but again, they were not uh, really big films. Uh, so we're we're going to kind of go into. Uh, the development of Back to the Future, which was happening around that time. And what happened was, is uh, Bob Gale, who was a uh, collaborator with Zemeckis, uh, decided to make, uh, they, they wrote the script for Back to the Future, uh, and they shopped it around Hollywood. But because his first two films had bonded the box office, a lot of people did not want to take risks, despite the fact Spielberg was backing them. Um, and they wound up going to every single studio uh, in Hollywood, and they all said, oh, take it to Disney. And uh, finally, they, they ran out of studios, so they took it to Disney, and Disney uh, <laughs> ironically turned them, also turned them down. Uh, but the funny part about it was is that uh, Disney turned it down because, oh, well, Back to the Future, you have a, a kid kissing his mom. You know, that, that, that's, that's not very family-friendly, and uh, yada, 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 and they took it, they took it very much out of context uh, after reading the script, which, of course, it plays out far differently uh, in the film, but uh, that's the difference. And Zemeckis was so frustrated that he could not get Back to the Future made that he basically uh, said at the time, I will do whatever movie crosses my desk next. And uh, that movie happened to be Romancing the Stone, which uh, he would make with uh, Michael Douglas and uh, Kathleen Turner and Danny DeVito and that movie is kind of, it shows a lot of what Robert Zemeckis' directing style was, especially at the beginning, and what it kind of kept kept as it went on, but not as much so, was that kind of fun-loving nature that, you know, it, it's one of those things when you watch a Robert Zemeckis film, it's like movie magic. You, you watch it, and you kind of have that feeling. It's kind of like when you watch... Uh, you know, I don't want to compare uh, some of his movies to uh, the legendary status of like The Wizard of Oz, but I kind of always got that feeling uh, when I was watching a movie like Back to the Future uh, or Romancing the Stone or Who Framed Roger Rabbit and stuff like that, where it was almost like it was it was movie magic. It was like I was seeing something on screen that was so fun loving and so good. Uh, but you know. Romancing the Stone, again, very good movie, and it was really, it was kind of an off-color off movie for uh, Michael Douglas, who uh, was doing, uh, who both later on and before was doing mostly dramas, obviously he went on to do stuff like Wall Street in the 80s, uh, and other stuff like uh, Basic Instinct and things like that, uh, which, you know, he didn't really do very many fun-loving movies, uh, but again, the it worked. He worked. Kathleen Turner worked in that movie. Danny DeVito surprisingly worked in that movie, uh, even though he's really a comic relief character. Uh, but Romancing the Stone is a great movie, but here's the most important thing to Zemeckis for Romancing the Stone, and that is Back to the Future. Because after Romancing the Stone came out and it was a hit, then everybody wanted to make Zemeckis' next film, and Zemeckis said he wanted to make Back to the Future, and of course it was picked up by 20th Century Fox. Uh, so Gale and Zemeckis went forward, and uh, they got Alan Silvestri to do the music, and you had Back to the Future in 1985. And Back to the Future, there, there may have not been a more important adventure movie in the 1980s. 
There may have not been a more important adventure movie until Spielberg came out with Jurassic Park in 1993. Uh, because Back to the Future did so many things correctly. Uh, and it it's in, amazing to watch. And honestly, I actually prefer the sequel, uh, Back to the Future Part Two, as the I think of that personally. For me, that's the best one in the series. But the first one does such a great job of setting everything up. And the production of that movie was a living hell. Uh, because the original actor who was supposed to play... The, the, originally, Zemeckis wanted uh, Michael J. Fox to play uh, Marty McFly. Unfortunately, he was involved in a television show at the time that was uh, being filmed, and they would not let him out of his contract uh, to go do Back to the Future. So, ironically, the Michael J. Fox basically had to work 16-hour uh, days, so he would film eight hours... Uh, for the uh, television show, and then he would film another eight hours on Back to the Future. And uh, it was actually reported that he had to have uh, studio people actually drag him into his house uh, at the end of the day because he was so tired uh, that he actually could not physically uh, make his way into his home. And then they would have to go, eventually, they would have to go out and, uh, and wake him up. Uh, only, a, a, you know, I think it was probably only six hours after they dropped him off. And I was drawing a blank, but the show I was thinking of was Family Ties. Uh, so, basically, uh, he pretty much worked a horrible, horrible schedule in 1985 to do that movie for the length of its production. Uh, and Zemeckis himself uh, worked extremely hard on that movie and even harder on the sequels, which just showed his commitment to getting that film done. But the thing is, when you watch a film like Back to the Future, it, especially for the first time, it's one of those movies that it grabs you in, and it's this fun story, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't beat you over the head with a bunch of uh, subliminal stuff. It's all right out in front, and it it really makes the movie that much better to watch because it's not. I I wouldn't say it's a movie where you have to turn your brain off, uh, but it's a movie where you can just sit down and enjoy. It's good popcorn entertainment. Uh, I guess is the uh, the term that gets used most often. Uh, but moving past uh, the first Back to the Future, uh, not long after that, in uh, 1988, uh, Zemeckis proceeded to make uh, a film that I really enjoyed as a kid, and I think a lot of people did, which was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And, uh, you know, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was one of those movies that, again, it pushed a lot of special effects at the time, uh, because it was combining, uh, you know, traditional animation styles uh, with actual uh, with actual live action actors. You know, you had scenes with Bob Hoskins where he was handcuffed to Roger Rabbit, and they're in the same scene, and they have to kind of act each other out. And it's actually kind of funny seeing the uh, the special effects shots in those films where you see like a lot of the times like the scenes where they have the the weasels and stuff coming into uh, Eddie Valiant's office. Uh, if you if you edit out the uh, animation, it's actually they're actually the guns and stuff that they're holding, which are real in in the movie, or they look real. They're real life guns as opposed to animated guns. Uh, they have uh, strings attached to them, and that's how they're moving around the set. And then they would just edit out the strings, uh, and they would put in the animation to cover everything up. But it was an amazing way uh, to do that film, and I don't think they've ever really done. To the extent of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, I know they've done other movies where they've they've uh, animated in uh, cartoons and stuff with real people, but there's never been another film like Roger Rabbit that meshed them so perfectly. Uh, and it's honestly it's an amazing film to watch from a special effects standpoint as well as just an audience. Uh, I mean, it, again, the other thing is it's funny. It has a, a relatively good and simple plot line. Great for kids, uh, even more so uh, for older people. Of course, you had um, the uh, Bob Hoskins, who plays Eddie Valiant, who does an amazing job. Uh, and then you also have Christopher Lloyd coming back from Back to the Future, who plays uh, Judge Doom. And it is, uh, and again, he plays a very haunting performance, especially what they do with his voice. And I can't remember, I'm assuming they use some kind of a modulator on his voice at the end of the film when his, his voice changes. But he is... At the end of that movie, he is terrifying as a person. Uh, just the the way that he looks and the way that uh, he speaks and stuff like that is horrifying. Uh, 
but you know to move past that uh, we go into uh, the Back to the Futures 2 and 3. Now this was a huge uh, thing for Zemeckis because he wasn't, again, he, he fought so hard to get the first Back to the Future made and now uh, he's gotten 2 and 3 that have been greenlit and they're going to be filming back to back and released in back to back years. So like I said, Back to the Future Part 2 is my favorite of the series mostly just because it ups the ante. Uh, so much from the first one where you get to go into the future, you have the hoverboard, the DeLorean can fly now, all this stuff with Doc Brown and uh, how Marty screws up the, the future with the, uh, the, uh, the sports almanac and all of that. And it just, it ups the, uh, it ups the stakes so much, especially when you see how bad Marty screws up. And again, like I said in my character video, this is where Marty really has a serious story arc where it starts where you know, he has to fix something that he really messed up. It's not He's not fixing things in the past that, that happened and he's just making them better. He's fixing something that he legitimately messed up. Uh, so you get to see him uh, do that. And you get to see him grow through that experience. And, of course, at the end of it, uh, it leads into Part 3. Uh, but, again, just to stay with Part 2, again, it's got the special effects, too. The special effects of that movie are great, especially the practicals. The practical special effects are amazing with the flying, the uh, scenes of the hovering DeLorean and, uh, you know, the hoverboard scenes and stuff like that. Those are all amazing. Uh, and so now you move into Back to the Future Part 3. Now, here's the thing with the production of Back to the Future Part 2 and 3 is Robert Zemeckis, because they were filming these back to back, they were actually filming Part 3 while he was editing Part 2. Uh, so what would happen was, uh, is that I believe they were filming part two in uh, either Arizona or New Mexico. And so uh, Robert Zemeckis, they would film uh, Back to the Future part three. He kind of he kind of basically had to do what Michael J. Fox did during the filming of the first one is they uh, he was filming part three and then he would have to get on a plane, fly back to L.A., uh, look at the uh, do the start or not start, but do the editing for part two. And then he would have to fly back in the morning to go and get the, start getting the shoot done for part three. And he was doing this through a lot of the production because the editing process for part two is very extensive. So he was, he was putting himself through the ringer. He was, he was on two flights a day going back and forth, which is insane. You know, the, you're, you're commuting by airplane, which is, uh, which is ridiculous in many ways. But, you know, it's something that, that happens. Um, and so... After the completion of parts two and three, uh, which aired, and then part uh, part two was in 1989, part three was in 1990, and again, I I'll go back to part three again with the Marty character is uh, that's where he ultimately has the finishing of his of his character growth. You know, he grows as a as, as a person where he's not as hot headed anymore, and he goes to the old west to save his best friend, and ultimately everything works out in the end. And that's the, th the other thing I like about Zemeckis films is most of the time, unless uh, unless you're getting teased with a sequel, Zemeckis films end on, end on a happy note. And I'm a lot of the times I'm a sucker for a happy ending, uh, and I I think he is too. And it's kind of the classic. Uh, you know the classic Hollywood interpretation of you know the you know the end uh, you know the guy gets the girl everything works out and they ride off into the sunset. So, but that's really uh, the closing of what I would consider Zemeckis's uh, early career, even though it's a it spans about ten years. Um, and now we're going to go into really kind of his critical acclaimed career or his critically acclaimed films. Um, and I'm, I'm going to touch on the major ones. Um, you know, he did a lot of small projects, video shorts and stuff like that, some stuff for Back to the Future. But really, uh, he hit it big in uh, the early 90s with Forrest Gump. And, of course, that won Academy Awards. That really launched Tom Hanks's career out of before when he was mainly doing comedies. Uh, now he was a full-fledged dramatic actor, and he's still doing that today, as many people can see. You know, he's kind of the go-to actor whenever somebody does, like, a true story, because they do the uh, Miracle on the Hudson or uh, the uh, pirate fiasco there uh, in Somalia and stuff like that. But Forrest Gump is a film... Um, I think it's a good film in terms of Zemeckis' directing. I just don't really care much for the Forrest Gump character in general. But I know why he is the way he is, which is why I like the movie. Uh, and I know that's a, little, uh, that's a little off. But the idea of Forrest Gump is that he is essentially a blank slate. The audience is kind of supposed to live through him almost. They're supposed to 
project themselves onto him, which works well for the movie because the movie is based, even though Forrest Gump is a fictional character, the movie is based on real life events uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. You know, he meets Elvis, he goes to Vietnam, he plays at Alabama when they're winning championships in the, uh, I think it was the 70s. Um, you know, the whole uh, stuff with the AIDS virus, um, you know, and a bunch of other things. So, the, the, but the Forrest Gump as a movie, I feel, is carried more by the side characters, specifically uh, Jenny and Lieutenant Dan. Uh, now, the Jenny character, uh, I always thought of her as kind of a vile bitch. Uh, but in the, in the, the, this is kind of the funny thing about her character. It's like, okay, you know, they're kids. She kind of wants nothing to do with them when they're older. She's kind of just, you know, whatever. And then... When they get to a point, then they get into a relationship, and then she basically, uh, she has sex with him and then leaves, and has a kid and doesn't tell him. Uh, and then, uh, and then when she knows she's dying of age, she has him come back in, and <laughs> that's just one of those uh, those kind of things. Like, hey, uh, I had your kid, but I'm dying of age, so here's a kid. Uh, you know, and she always seemed like kind of a kind of a bitchy character, especially the uh, as an adult. Um, Lieutenant Dan, on the other hand, I really enjoyed uh, his character because he was he was probably the most complex character in the entire film. Uh, you know, from the time in Vietnam, loses his legs, uh, all the interactions he has with uh, with Forrest and the, the shrimping business and all that stuff. And then at the end, when he has the conclusion to his story arc, when he has the fake legs and he's getting married and everything like that, and it's it's really really uh, a good character arc in that movie and he ironically the side character has more characteristics than the main one because really Forrest Gump at the beginning of the movie uh, is essentially the same character that we end with except that things have happened to him he's really he doesn't change in his attitudes towards life at all uh, the only thing that really changes at the very end I would say the most drastic change is him becoming a father but again I don't have any problem with the directing of the movie. I think the directing of the movie is great. And I think the idea of the film is great. Again, I just don't like the Forrest Gump character. Um, but I understand why he's that way. And that's my personal thing. That doesn't Objectively, it is still a very, very good movie. And he is still a good character. Just personally, I don't like him. Um, now, I'm just going to quickly go over uh, Contact. Because Contact is kind of a weird one in there. It's not really uh, Zemeckis's typical fare, uh, even with his dramas and stuff like that. It has Jodie Foster. Um, it's really just about this weird kind of alien plot line. Uh, again, that, that's a movie I don't know if I'd recommend. It's kind of again, it's kind of strange, especially near the end of it. Um, but it, it's thought provoking in a way that Zemeckis films hadn't been in the past. Again, many of his films are very straightforward. Um, but I'm just going to glaze over that a little bit, and I'm going to go into uh, what is his, what I would consider his later career, um, which is his films in the uh, early to uh, mid, in the decade of the 2000s, so from 2000 all the way up to 2010, or uh, I think 2011 is when the last film here came out. So you start off with Castaway in 2000. Now Castaway, again, Tom Hanks comes back uh, to play in this film, and this, again, was a lot like Forrest Gump in the sense that it's a drama, uh, it's set over many, many years, um, and Tom Hanks, again, does a great job in a dramatic role. I can't remember if he won an Oscar for this film, um, but again, it's very compelling, and it, like Zemeckis film, like good Zemeckis films, it's straightforward. It's it's very straightforward, and it works. The premise works, uh, and it was also, uh, you know, a huge advertisement for FedEx, um, and soccer balls and Wilson soccer balls, apparently. Um, but you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a testament to, uh, it's a, it's a testament to Robert Zemeckis that he made you feel for a soccer ball, an inanimate object with a face painted on it in human blood. And that is, that is a testament to him as a director. That is, and it, it's amazing that he can make you feel something for an inanimate object that doesn't speak and doesn't move. And Tom Hanks gives it all its personality. You know, when he loses that soccer ball, when he has the wrath and he's trying to escape from the island, you legitimately feel sad, uh, you know, for Tom Hanks that he lost, like, the only friend that he had. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is the point where I, I think um, Zemeckis, for a little while, he went away from the serious movies. Um, and I think that's what... And, You'll see that again because he goes into Polar Express, which was a, a CGI film, was a CGI animated film. Uh, again, Tom Hanks provides some voice work, 
Uh, but it's, again, it's one of those fun movies. It's more of a kid-based thing. It's kind of like Roger Rabbit in a sense uh, that is kind of based in a, lo in a lower era. But again, it's really, really good, um, especially for the younger crowd. And it, I wouldn't say it's a deep movie, but it's a fun movie. And that's really the trademark of Robert Zemeckis is he makes fun movies. Uh, and then we go into another 3D one, which this is kind of a stumble for him, which was Beowulf. And Beowulf, again, is it's based off of the uh, classic uh, story of Beowulf, uh, which basically has this, this Norse warrior who's uh, fighting this uh, evil... There's three uh, enemies. There's, there's uh, an evil like ogre type thing called Grendel and then there's the Grendel's mother who he also kills and then there at the end very end he's old man Beowulf and there's a dragon that he has to kill um but it's they they do twist the story a bit so that all three of them are a bit more connected uh, than they should be Angelina Jolie plays uh, Grendel's mother which is really weird um you know it was it was kind of one of those movies that was a bit off because they they do use some real CGI acting and stuff with the uh, facial expressions and everything but it 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 feels off it doesn't feel like a polar express that i would consider that a bit of a stumble for him personally um but again it's a movie that it, you know it's hard to adapt stuff like that and i think he did a decent job with what he was given uh, cuz it's a you know it's a very very old story it's not something that's very easily adaptable um and uh, then you have another one, which, again, I have some issues with, which is A Christmas Carol, which is uh, the main voice. Uh, it, again, it's one of those 3D animated films. He has kind of this trio of 3D animated films with uh, Polar Express, Beowulf, and A Christmas Carol. And A Christmas Carol has um, Jim Carrey playing Ebenezer Scrooge. And what, I think Jim Carrey did a fairly good job in the movie um, voicing the character. I don't think he did an outrageous job. I think the animation in the film is probably the best... Uh, out of any film that Zemeckis has worked on. Uh, the only problem that I would give to the film is the script. And normally uh, Zemeckis, and I don't know if Gail was involved with that one, uh, but normally when Zemeckis writes scripts, it's very fun, it's very upbeat. Uh, the dialogue is, is not uh, is not terribly snappy, uh, but it's, it's definitely, uh, it gets the point across very well. With A Christmas Carol, they almost did a direct rip from the, uh, from the, the actual Charles Dickens novel, uh, which the problem is, is that some of the things in the novel do not necessarily translate very well to screen. There's a lot of tangents that they go on uh, in the film uh, in ye old English or, or you know, uh, polit political or social problems of the time, which really uh, make no sense to us today. Um, and there's a, a specific conversation that uh, Scrooge has with, I believe it's the ghost of Christmas past uh, over... Uh, I, it, it's a political issue involving uh, the poor, I believe, but it's uh, it's really not pertinent to, to uh, stuff today, but they left it in there. Um, and I think that, that ultimately detracts from the film. I think Zemeckis could have done better with uh, trimming that film down a bit more and uh, streamlining it a bit uh, to, to make it uh, more compelling and keep more to the narrative of uh, Scrooge and his story. Um, and really, to, and to, to round out uh, his films, which... Uh, again, I think this is probably his best film since probably Castaway uh, is Flight with Denzel Washington. And that movie, um, like a lot of really great movies, it's a character study. And it's a character study of Denzel Washington, who's this uh, pilot, and he's, he's flying this plane that happens to cra that has a mechanical failure that really isn't his fault, and it crashes, uh, but they blame him for it, and he's an alcoholic and stuff like that, and he does drugs. Uh, John Goodman plays his drug dealer, which is probably one of the funniest cameos I've seen in a while. Or, I uh, shouldn't say cameos, but supporting roles. And, uh, really, uh, again, th this, this film kind of falls along his dramatic films. It, I, I would put it a, a bit with some of the humor levels of... Uh, of Forrest Gump uh, and stuff like that. I wouldn't say it's nearly as serious as Castaway uh, until like some, the courtroom scenes and stuff like that. A lot of it's pretty funny, especially with John Goodman. Uh, the stuff with him is hilarious, even though it probably isn't meant to be, but I think it's funny. Uh, but again, that is an extremely good movie. You should watch it. Um, but uh, you know that kind of rounds out what his modern era of films is. And you know, Robert Zemeckis is one of those people. He started out as really a Spielberg protege, and he's become essentially become the master. He's be, become a master filmmaker, and 
he's shown that, that he's able to do multiple things, which is, again, that's a great trademark of a filmmaker. There's not many of them that can do that. Uh, you look at guys like, you know, there's a few handful of them. You look at guys like Ridley Scott or Spielberg or uh, Stanley Kubrick, and I'd have to put Zemeckis in there because he's able to do uh, films from multiple genres. Uh, the only ones I don't think he's really touched on are, uh, really, I think horror is the only one that I think he really hasn't touched on that much. Uh, but he's done suspense, he's done thrillers, um, uh, he's done, you know, adventure films, he's done a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, really, that that's the thing, is that you need to go and just, if you sit down and watch a, Zeme a Zemeckis film, it's one of those things where you could be smiling ear to ear from beginning to end, because it's just it's that enjoyable to watch. It's a fun story. It's kind of like when you have a, a story when you're a kid, when you have that favorite storybook that your parents read to you before bed. It, it feels like that. It feels like you're, you're reading that favorite story, but it's being enacted on screen. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I love Zemeckis. Um, and, you know, so that, that, that's, uh, that's how I feel about him in conclusion. And uh, why don't you guys uh, tell me how you feel about Robert Zemeckis in the comments? Uh, what's your favorite Zemeckis film? Uh, and, uh, you know, would you like to see any of the other movies that I've mentioned uh, if you haven't seen them already? And remember, hit the like button on the video, hit the bell for notifications, and I live my life free of compromise. Do you?